I know of a, of a student, of a student of mine who went overseas to study and he went to go uh, memorize Quran. And he went, I won't mention the country, but he went to this small country in, in Africa. And in this country, he had to go to this tiny village where all this village does, the village has 200 people in it. And they live in tents. They don't even live in homes. The, the only permanent building there is this one small building in which foreigners who are visiting get to spend the night. Otherwise, everybody sleeps outside under the stars or they sleep in tents. It takes 16 hours to get to this village, this, literally this little tent city of 200 people. 16 hours where you have to go in these big SUVs and you go over these huge rocks. When you get to this uh, little town, I, I feel weird even calling it a town. It's not a town, but you, you get the idea. When they get there, when people get out of the cars, the first thing the villagers do who've come to greet the people is they step back because they know the second people get out of the car, they're going to throw up because the drive is so difficult getting there. This is a kind of village. It's completely off the map. It's in the middle of nowhere. There are no towns around it. So this child went there to memorize Quran. All night, they say it's like bees humming. You just hear people reciting Quran throughout the night because in the daytime it's so hot. So people do their memorizing at night. It takes, there's, there's no electricity there. At, people walk around with gas lanterns. There's one generator and there's one outlet. It takes three days to power up a phone. There's one person in this community who's in charge of taking your phone. He will power your phone for three days and then he will give it back to you. This boy told me that in that environment, boys who were memorizing Quran would take their cell phones. They would go up into the mountains. They would go like this. They would find a signal and they would watch pornography. So there's literally nowhere to escape it. It's really heartbreaking. So we have to, just like we teach our kids how to swim, or when our kids learn how to drive, we teach them how to be safe with seat belts. Um, it's our job just to give them the tools how to deal, and then at some point they need to know the right thing to do if they come across something that's harmful to them. And like I said, after every talk, I learned something new. I just had a mom recently tell me that she was on Amazon looking for boys' briefs for her son. And she typed up boys' briefs, and kinky images came up of all sorts of other haram things. And she said that the pictures were really obscene, and the private parts were just kind of blurred, but you could still see what it was. And that was on Amazon. And Sheikh Rami Ansur, who is my son's Quran teacher up north, he warned the kids that um, there have been incidents where there are videos that say Surah Mulk on YouTube, and kids will click on it, or people will click on it to listen to Surah Mulk or watch Surah Mulk, and it'll actually be pornography. Once it's discovered and it's reported, YouTube takes it down. But if you happen to be, or your child, God forbid, happens to be the first one to click on it, then, you know, it's a problem. There is no utopia. There is no perfect community or perfect country or perfect neighborhood or perfect place or environment where you can escape this. Nowhere. I had a cousin visiting me and she, we were talking about it because her children all had these internet gadgets that they were using and I was, we were talk, talking about the dangers of the internet and she said, Oh, Hinabaji, thank God I, I live in such and such Islamic country. Over there the government is so strict. And I didn't even have to say anything. Her husband just started shaking his head. And he was like, no, honey, 